My name is Greg Hoagland. I work for a company called HP Gary. And this is a subject that uh, we've been kind of looking at for just under a year now, just toying with it. But in the last six months or so, I've been putting uh, quite a bit of research time into it. So I know attribution is a big word. So I want to preface this talk. Uh, I'm not trying to solve the problem or you're going to identify the guy by name. What we're going to talk about here is the stuff that you're going to be able to see in the raw data that comes in an attack to better inform your defensive capability in your enterprise. And that's going to be all about picking things that are as close to the human as possible. The medium, the content has medium level technical content. It's not too bad. Um, I do have a lot of slides. Uh, usually I do, so I probably will go pretty fast through them. So in advance, please forgive me for that. Um, the whole reason I'm talking about attribution today is because the uh, typical methods that we've been using over the last 10 years or so have not been very effective at keeping bad guys out of the network. Um, it's safe to say that most people would agree the bad guys are kind of on the upper edge of the curve right now, and that cybercrime is rapidly becoming a dominant global criminal problem. Uh, for example, the Russian mafia made more money in banking fraud last year than the Colombians made selling fake cars. And the largest computing cloud in the world is run by Comticker. I think those two statistics alone should pretty much set the stage that uh, we got to do something different, something different than the way we've been, been doing it over the last 10 years to really make a dent in this problem. So this is my basic diagram, kind of the philosophy of or the approach. On one end of this spectrum, we have binaries. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have a human being who is using that binary to perform actions on intent. He's doing something bad in your network, and that's an extension of his digital identity. His behaviors are reflected through those tools and the things that he uses that tool for. That thing in the middle called move this way, that's the aperture of visibility. Those are the things that you can derive from the raw attack data. I would posit that most of our approaches have traditionally been further down towards the binary side of this. What I'd like to do is open your minds today that we can slide to that window much closer to the human than we traditionally have in the past. <clears throat> This diagram here shows just some of the black market that exists in the malware, the global malware economy. There's a lot of money being made. There, there are hackers who work for cash, and they get paid a lot of money to um, find exploits, build remote access tools, and come up with new mechanisms for exploitation. Just let's go through it a little bit. A guy writing rootkits in St. Petersburg can easily get $10,000 US dollars for a rootkit, brand new, that will go zero day. The implant vendor up here, what he does is he takes different uh, exploits from different sources, and he will also take things like rootkits and remote access tools, and he will build essentially an a, a capability to put a remote access tool on a target machine. That's called an implant. Those will be sold in forums and on auction sites for well over $500 a package. The bot vendor over here buys those and then uses them to deploy botnets. Botnets are bought and sold daily. This is a whole new marketplace in access. The exploit pack vendor up here, I'm sure some of you have heard of Eleanor Pack, um, these things sell for over $1,000. I'm not proud. I will actually go and buy them myself just so I can get access to them. I'll pretend to be somebody I'm not, and I will spend the $1,000, and I will look to see what their capabilities are. Also, because these guys are pretty nefarious to begin with, a lot of times they'll buy them and then just give them away. So there's a lot of piracy. So if you were to go on the net, you can actually find a lot of this in the open source and download it and do your own research. This um, whole scenario goes all the way down to this forger down here in the corner who has nothing to do with the computer scams and operation. He just makes fake IDs for $50 each. So everybody's making money on the scheme. There's so much uh, PPI being stolen that the guy, the affiliate ID thief down here on the bottom, sells it by the megabyte. This is a Multigo canvas. I don't know if you've heard of Multigo, but if you haven't, you should definitely check it out. It's a leak analysis program. This is zoomed out, so you can't actually see the data for each node, but there is a key down in the corner. What this is right here is something called the installs marketplace. I had an analyst at HB Gary put this together. He went into the auction sites where you can buy botnets. I can buy about 1,000 machines for about 100 US dollars. Those machines are distributed all over the world. The price of the botnet depends upon what country it's in. Furthermore, some of those botnets are within government installations. All right, so I'll talk more about that at the end of the presentation. This is my favorite slide. Uh, I'm really proud of this, this diagram. 
uh, I call it the intelligence spectrum, and it ranges from the nearly useless to the nearly impossible. The nearly useless is your MD5 checksum of a file. That has absolutely no value for detecting bad guys in your enterprise. There are exploit servers that can drop a new binary. Every single install, every single penetration, it changes that on the fly. It packs on the fly, you'll never have the same MD5 twice. On the other side, we have the social security number and missile coordinates of the attacker. Now that would be great, but unless you're an intelligence agency, it's very unlikely you're gonna be getting to that level. Where I wanna focus most of my effort in the talk is on what I call the sweet spot. But it's worth noting that binaries alone are not the only source of data that you can use for attribution. How did the bad guy attack you? How did you perform recon prior to the attack? What was the last hop in the email chain before the spear phishing attack came in? What are his tactics, techniques, and procedures once he's on the system? What does he do and how does he behave? All of those can be used together to do attribution. Unfortunately, most enterprises don't store all of that data in a way that it can be easily accessed. And I call that the archaeology problem. Most organizations do, in fact, have large repositories of binaries that were used to attack them. So I think that's where we're going to get our most bang for the buck. But let's talk about the different things you could see at each one of these different locations on the intelligence spectrum. Starting with net recon and command and control, you've got DNS. You can black hole. You can go through DNS records, try to find out machines that might be compromised by those. You have the C2 protocol. Useful, because it tends to last a while. The bad guy can't turn that off real quick, because then you'd cut all of his agents offline. Encryption method. Actually, you'd think that'd be something they wouldn't rewrite a lot, but they do. And bad guys focus a lot of their effort on obfuscating their perimeter, view, the, the network communications, because they know that your primary defense is at the perimeter. Shell code doesn't get rewritten too much. There's a lot of variants there. You can use those as a, a, a fingerprint. The way that the delivery vehicle is weaponized. Exploits are hard to make reliable. It's easy to make something crash, but for anybody who's actually done real vuln research and actually made uh, exploits, they'll tell you the same thing. Making an exploit reliable is a whole different ball game than somebody who just gets it to crash once and the phase of the moon is just right. Now on that one VMware image only, it crashed. And yeah, he can go to ZDI and sell it for $400. But if you go and you weaponize a payload for Internet Explorer, you can go to the Russian Mafia and get $50,000. Um, defensive tr tricks, I'll show, uh, I think I have some of those in the slide presentation, and the anti-forensics, the comms level. And by comms, I don't mean the protocol. I mean the outer loop that controls the various ways the sockets are managed. A lot of that remains unchanged. Um, CNA, not a lot of stuff that I see has CNA capabilities. By that, I mean a computer network attack, the ability to shut stuff down. But a lot of them have CNE, which is essentially scanning the drive for an intellectual property, wrapping it up, and exfilling it out of the network. So that's just some terminology difference there, CNA, CNE. Command and control, uh, again, primary outer loop, the way it survives reboot, and finally, all the way down to actions on intent, which is how does, what does the attacker do once he's in that lets you know what he's after? Is he trying to steal intellectual property, or is he just after people's uh, credit card numbers? This Intel value window slide, another one I really like, shows the relative time and decay that a particular kind of signature has to you in terms of what it can do in your, in your, in your enterprise. So a checksum is very, very short-term life cycle. An IP address, almost as bad. The bad guys will take their registered DNS name and turn it on and off. It'll go to 127.001 one day, and then 6 a.m. the next morning, it pops up with a new IP, then it goes down, and it comes up again the next day. You can't really use IPs as a mechanism for this. DNS works a little bit longer, but not that much longer. We've seen malware, well, they'll have multiple different C2s in there. The first DNS name, if it gets black hole, the thing goes to sleep for three weeks and then tries to connect out to the second one. So you may get some of them out of your enterprise, but you won't get all of them, and that's the whole point. And then protocol. Now, by protocol, I mean, how does it actually transfer the data? Sans DNS name. Doesn't matter where the C2 server lives. What is the protocol it uses to communicate? That doesn't change very often. And the reason why is if they change that, then all the agents that are being managed with that system would go offline. Um, so they would actually be putting up a new system, standing up a new system if they were changing the protocol. How it survives reboot, that's what I mean by install. Uh, there's only so many good ways to do that, and I'll go through some of those in the talk. Uh, how does it hook into the OS? What are the algorithms that are used, et cetera? And then I'm going to spend quite a bit of time talking about developer tool marks. The algorithms are really good to focus on uh, because software is hard to write. Whether you're a white hat or a black hat, it's hard to make software reliable. So those guys, when they get it to work, they're not going to change it. They're just going to keep reusing that stuff year after year. Now, uh, let me talk about three basic rules that I'm going to... Uh, just basically the reason why attribution works. 
Uh, the first one is human beings aren't going to rewrite their malware every single morning. It's not economically feasible to do so. They can change the way it looks on the wire with MD5 checksum and whatnot, but they're not going to rewrite the source code itself. So they can make 50,000 new variants of the same source code. It can defeat AV, but it doesn't mean that when you get to the end system and it sniffs keystrokes, that he's using any other mechanism than he's been using for the last three weeks or the last three years to, get to sniff the keystrokes. So they don't rewrite their code every morning. Rule number two, this will probably change in the future, but right now, the bad guys are, focused, are focusing all of their effort on obfuscating the network view of their traffic. And the reason is simple, because that's your primary defense that you're focusing all your effort on. So, you know, they're pushing back on that. So you have multiple dynamic DNS servers, multiple C2 servers in within a payload. We have uh, lots of different methods for obfuscating network traffic. I have got a malware right now that hooks into, it's a kernel mode rootkit. It actually injects into Internet Explorer when it's brought up. And then when you communicate, when you click out on the net with IE, it actually injects uh, ad clicks. And they, they're not real ad clicks. They just look like ad clicks to somebody who's sniffing the network. And that's the actual exfiltration of data going out. Very difficult to find stuff like this. And, um, but they're not so focused on host level stealth, which goes to my next rule. Um, being at the host is almost like cheating right now. And physical memory is king. If you're analyzing physical memory, if you're dumping FizzMems, you're getting volatile runtime data that was calculated while the software ran. By its very nature, you tend to defeat encryption. You tend to defeat packing. You tend to defeat a lot of the things that are a real pain in the you-know-what at the network and at the disk level. So physical memory is a great place to be. And there are a lot of products in the industry emerging in this space. And I encourage you, if you haven't already examined some of them, to look about this. So basically, in my talk, I'm going to talk about how we extract some of the software behaviors that have expressed themselves in memory. And when I talk about memory, I'm almost always talking about physical memory. Um, now, why don't MD5 checksums work for FizzMem? It's pretty simple. I can have a binary on disk. It can be whitelisted or, you know, whatever. And when it loads into memory, its MD5 checksum is not going to be consistent because things are reorganized in memory. Uh, sections are resized. Some of the things on disk are never even loaded. And some of the things in memory were never represented on disk. Obviously, one bit changes, the MD5 checksum changes. So that's why it's just not the right solution for dealing with in memory. But the software traits themselves, if you were to go and on the fly, let's say, disassemble all the different software that's in there and get the symbol information, you would find that symbol information does not change in this binary. It stays the same. So the software traits remain consistent. What does it do and what is the order it does it in? Now let's talk about that in the context of malware. One malware program, two different packers. The portions of the malware that are decrypted or deobfuscated into memory will express the same characteristics. And that's why the efficacy for an intrusion detection signature working at this level is far greater than some of them that work at the, uh, at the network layer. Now, let's take three different programs. These could be three different pass the hash toolkits. These could be three different of the same program, but compiled with different compiler flags. Maybe one has stack pointer emission turned on and the other doesn't, etc. That would make the binaries look significantly different. But again, when you're in memory, the software traits remain consistent, even if they're separate tools because the tools do the same thing. And then finally, um, you don't need to be a reverse engineer to do this. When you're looking at physical memory and you're looking at software that's executing, you're dealing largely with an environment of data structures. And what is a packet sniff if not a giant list of data structures? So if you can read a packet sniffer, you can do attribution. And I think this is a very important point to make, because I think that if you use the dreaded RE term, a lot of organizations get really scared and think, oh my gosh, this won't scale, this is expensive, we can't do this, we've got 30 machines to get through before 3 o'clock this afternoon in our IR team, there's no way we can do this. That's not true. Attribution is something you can do because it's largely based on human readable ASCII strings buried inside of data structures, exactly the same thing that you're already used to seeing in a packet log. All right, so this, this is going to be focusing on the developer, developer tool marks. Now, take a look at this slide. On the, on the left-hand side, we have all the different uh, things that go into the source code itself. Then we have a compilation step, including linking. And we have runtime libraries that get linked in. We have machine-level data, such as time, local drive paths, even a MAC address, which I have an interesting example of. And then finally, a malware popping out the other side, which then there may be one more step, the packing step, which does a post obfuscation on that binary. At every single step of this flow, there is the potential that a forensic tool mark, one or more, will be left behind in the binary. That's where we're going to focus. No single tool mark by itself would ever be